guest speaker today is Dr. William Trumbull. He's a professor of economics at the Citadel in Charleston, South Carolina. She has a BS in business administration from the University of Miami and a PhD in economics from the University of North Carolina. He is an expert on socialist and post-socialist economies with a particular emphasis on entrepreneurship in post-socialist countries. He has published uh, many academic articles in such leading journals as the Review of Economics and Statistics, the Southern Economic Journal, Defense and Peace Economics, and Public Choice. The talk that he's going to be giving right now is titled Healthcare in Cuba. Is it what it's cracked up to be? Is it superior to U.S. healthcare? So please join me in welcoming Professor Trump from the South State University. Are you Okay, guys, question. What kind of the economy is Cuba? What economic system does it use? What? Socialism, okay. Is, is, is there a modifier to that? There's actually a couple of versions of socialism. What version of socialism does Cuba have? It's the same version that the Soviet Union had, Maoist China, East Germany, what? <clears throat> planned socialism. It was a planned socialist economy. Emphasis on the word planned. Okay? Hold that thought in mind. There's another version uh, called market socialism that was uh, used in, in the socialist Yugoslavia and nowhere else in the world. Kind of an interesting. But for the most part, the socialist world was this planned uh, socialist version. Okay, so healthcare in Cuba is what is, is it what it's cracked up to be. Um, there are a lot of metrics that we see uh, that that purport to measure the quality of healthcare. All right, um, and Cuba reports superior metrics despite spending a fraction of what the U.S. spends on healthcare. Um, for instance, infant mortality rate of, then this, you know, this bounces around from year to year, but the latest thing I've seen is 4.4 uh, per 1,000 live births in Cuba versus 5.7 in the U.S. That's a pretty significant um, difference there. Cuba's metric is superior to the U.S. Hmm. Life expectancy in Cuba is 78.9 years to, uh, uh, versus 77.8 years in the U.S. Apparently, Cubans live longer um, than in the U.S. Of course, the U.S. spends a lot more than Cuba does on a per capita basis on health care. The common wisdom says that Cuba has a superior healthcare system. Better outcomes, less spending. Okay? That's the story you see over and over and over again. And the question is, is this real? Is this real? Um, here's a post, uh, a Huffington Post uh, article in Praising Cuba, the World Health Organization stresses that it is possible for third world countries, including Cuba, um, with limited resources to implement an efficient health care system and provide all segments of the population with social protection worthy of the name. This is possible if the political will exists to put human beings at the center of the project. The political will put human beings at the center of the project. Is that really what's happening in Cuba? How can this be? Uh, we're going to call this story uh, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Uh, the good, Cuba has more doctors per capita than any other country in the world. By a long shot. Interestingly, it always has. Cuba had the most doctors before the revolution. This is kind of a Cuba thing, kind of part of their culture. Uh, there's the statistics. This is Cuba's per capita uh, doctors per 1,000 population compared to other countries in, uh, in Americas. 
compare, say, to Dominican Republic, which is right next door to Cuba, very, very, very similar kind of culture, background, et cetera. Um, where is the U.S. here? Much, much higher than the U.S. Sure, all, all these doctors. The three-tiered system, um, neighborhood clinics is the first tier. They provide monitoring and preventive care. Every neighborhood has a clinic staffed by a doctor and a nurse. They're all over the place. And that doctor and that nurse will go, if necessary, to neighbors' houses to check up on them. Very, very intensive system of monitoring to prevent bad things happening. Then there's general hospitals and uh, specialty facilities. Um, we're staffed by all the, the specialties you would expect in a hospital. But there are also some specialized hospitals, like what they call maternity homes. Um, HIV, AIDS, sanatoria, um, are another example. And then institutes, which are specialized. Uh, they do, they, that's where the research happens in healthcare in Cuba. Uh, and they're all located in Havana. Uh, neighborhood clinics, each staffed by a doctor and nurse. Uh, each these healthcare providers know each patient closely and monitor their health. It's pretty effective. Right? This is definitely part of the, the good in our story. Uh, of course, they, they monitor pregnancies very, very closely. The doctors receive the most basic training, but it's training that is sufficient for uh, their purpose role primary to monitor and provide very basic care, and if necessary, refer on to a hospital for more specialized care. Um, these clinics don't have much right? you know, in terms of medicines and equipment and that kind of thing. Um, they, they have very, very little compared to what you expect in say, a doctor's office here. Main role is prevention and detection of health problems. They do a good job of that. Hospitals. Uh, they provide more specialized care, as you would expect, better trained doctors, uh, yet they still suffer acute shortages. Um, they kind of two tiers of hospitals. One is for the upper. Um, the, 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 the party officials, the elites, and also for foreigners. Like, for instance, Kena uh, Sierra Garcia. I spent a lot of time in Cuba um, kind of staying in a neighborhood where this, this clinic is. This is a clinic for foreigners. Right? Cubans don't go there. And the reason is because foreigners can pay and Cubans can't. Right? Cubans have to be healthy. They don't get it at Sierra Garcia. The docs there are very well trained and experienced. I've got a personal experience there. Um, I had I had, I brought a group of students to Havana, a uh, study abroad that I did, and uh, we were staying in the house right across the street from this hospital. As soon as we get there, we arrived, and one of my students need balloons. I mean, she cannot walk. We're at the beginning of a study abroad experience where we're going to do a lot of walking, right? And she is just in absolute misery. There was a, a guy hanging around there. He was the husband of one of the people who, who cooked for us and kept the house and all that kind of stuff. He couldn't speak any English. I thought he was uh, a handyman. Well, it turned out I was wrong. She wasn't a handyman. He saw her, me. 
through his wife. Stay here, I'll be right back. He comes back with a surgical drape and a huge hypodermic needle. And he sticks that hypodermic needle in her knee and he drains the fluid out and she goes fine. It's like well, I got one handy. Um, that, that hospital is a leader in medical tourism. Even makes a lot of money bringing tourists in to receive health care for which they pay. The lower level, lower tiers for ordinary humans. Much poorer quality. Uh, many standard medicines are unavailable except on the black market. Patients have to provide their own medicines which on the black market are not free. Uh, they all, and, and generally speaking, they have to provide their own limits. So you'll see patients coming into this hospital carrying big you know, bags of stuff. What's in those bags? Their linens, towels, medicines, <coughs> their needles, etc. Um, let me read you something that I just pulled up from the Washington Post today. Uh, but while Cuba made great gains in primary and preventive care after the revolution, advanced health care is flagging in the famously closed country. Reliable statistics and rigorous studies are impossible to come by. Well, not necessarily totally impossible. We'll, we'll look at some just uh, in a minute. But anecdotally, it appears that health system used by average Cubans is in crisis. According to a report by the Institute for War and Peace, reporting hospitals are generally poorly maintained and short of staffs and medicine. The writer visited facilities in Havana, such as Calixo Garcia, the Estadel de Octubre, and Miguel Enrique hospitals, and described them in an advanced state of neglect and deterioration. In the Dies de Octubre, the floors are stained and surgeries and wards are not disinfected. Doors do not have locks and their frames are coming off. Some bathrooms have no toilets or sinks and the water supply is erratic. Back droppings, cockroaches, mosquitoes, and mice are all in evidence. That's the Washington Post. Part of the mouthpiece is conservative. Oh, they're, they're, they're the institutes. And these, these are where the best trained doctors are, highly specialized. And their role is to conduct research. And so, conclusion Cuba puts a lot of resources into healthcare given the uh, low income nature of the country. And, and why is this? Because providing healthcare is what a socialist country does, it is one of the fundamental promises of socialism. People are told, you do what we, the leadership, tell you to do. And as long as you do that, we will provide. We will provide you with an income. You know what the average monthly income is in Cuba for a state worker? They just had a recent uh, wage reform, which probably increased these numbers somewhat. But the average monthly wage for a worker in the state sector in Cuba is about $30. The doctor might make $8. The retail clerk may make $12 a month. How can you live off of $12 a month? You can't. The state provides. The state provides housing. The state provides some food. The state provides health care. The state provides a job. In other words, what the state provides in a planned socialist economy is economic security. Know where your next meal is coming from. There's no such thing as getting laid off, according to this promise. Uh, that's the reality. But that's a fundamental, this, this free health care is a fundamental promise of the social system. Universal access, which is free. The emphasis on prevention and monitoring 
person is at risk, the system will pick it up right away. The bad. Cuba has the highest abortion rate in the world. By far. 34.5 per 1,000 women in the age of 15 to 44 tripled the U.S. rate. 2.6 times higher than neighboring the Dominican Republic. Five times higher than Costa Rica. The only countries that come close, and they do come very close, are Russia and Georgia. There's, um, there's some sheriffs in Cuba with some of its neighboring countries. Huge abortion rate. What's going on there? Another bad thing. Cuba has an exceptionally high late fetal mortality. Late fetal mortality is death anywhere from 22 weeks of gestation to birth. Probably the highest late fetal mortality rate in the world. Now, do you think there might be a relationship between late fetal mortality and infant mortality? <coughs> Turns out that there is. Uh, I defy you to find the statistic anywhere. You won't find it in the World Bank's World Development Index. You won't find it in the CIA World Factbook. By the way, you all familiar with the, the World Factbook? CIA World Factbook? Absolutely. I mean, you need to become a right? Anything you want, oh, well, not quite anything, but almost anything you want to know about any country, its population, its geography, its politics, its history, its culture, and its economy, you can find on the CIA World Factory. Just Google CIA World Factory. If you ever need to do anything, any kind of area study or country study, that is the first place to go. The second place to go is probably the World Development or anything. Um, you're going to have a hard time finding late fetal mortality. That's not easy to find. Can't find it, but that's not what you get in the Hollywood Post or anything like that. People who, who think that Cuba has this fantastic healthcare system will use infant mortality rate, but not late fetal mortality. Now, what causes fetuses to die are usually pretty much the same things that cause newborn babies to die. So if you were to look at the relationship between late fetal mortality and neonatal infant mortality, that first week of life, that's what we mean by neonatal, there ought to be a very close relationship between those two statistics. Right? The late fetal rate and the neonatal rate should be closely related. And it shouldn't matter what country you're looking at whether the country is rich or the country is poor, because the two are determined by the same kinds of variables. Gonzalez and Gillespie, in 2017, used data from a World Health Organization study on the relationship between late fetal mortality rate and early neonatal so-called Peristat study on EU countries. The first thing they did is they came up with a consistent definition of infant mortality. It turns out that that definition is different in different countries. In fact, the US uses the most liberal possible definition of infant mortality. If you're born and you've got a heartbeat, you are alive, and if you then die, Two seconds later, that's an infant mortality. In most countries, you got to make it through the first day, or you're considered a fetal death, even though you've been your heart's been beating for a whole day, right? including Europe. And so the U.S. uses the most liberal definition of infant mortality, and therefore, its infant mortality tends to look bad 
because most other countries use a more restricted definition. They come up with the same definition and have adjust numbers uh, for all these European countries. And what they find is that the ratio of late fetal to um, neonatal in all countries lie between 1.04 and 3.03 for the average of 1.88. Okay, so there's this, this ratio between late fetal and um, early uh, neonatal. The Cuba's ratio is over six. Completely out of line. Completely out of line. What's going on? How could it be that this ratio between neonatal and late fetal is so out of line compared to other countries, countries in this parastat. But there have been other studies that found very similar results. There's always this close relationship, except in Cuba, where there is, there's a lot more late fetal mortality than neonatal mortality. <coughs> the data suggests that Cuba is underreporting infant mortality by classifying early neonatal deaths as And so what's going on, apparently, the data is telling us pretty strongly, pretty loudly, that babies are being born alive, and then they die, and they're being, repeated, they're being reported as late fetal which is not a statistic that is readily available. Gonzalez and Gillespie conclude that 33% to 50% of neonatal deaths are misclassified as late fetal deaths. They conclude that Cuba's actual infant mortality rate is twice what they report. Not 4.4, but 8, 9. Why is that? Gonzalez and Gillespie cite Hirschfeld, 2007 paper, who has documented under reporting underreporting other ways that healthcare in Cuba may not match official statistics. Uh, that's the site for work. Um, quotation to that, I found a number of discrepancies between the way the Cuban healthcare system has been described in the scholarly literature and the way it appears to be described and experienced by the Cubans themselves. Well, to understand what's going on, why this misclassification is going on, and why it is that the world perception of healthcare in Cuba seems to be different from the Cuban perspective uh, perception of healthcare, you got to understand a couple aspects uh, of, of Cuba. There is a book that has just been published. Yes. Um, by uh, Darren Asimoglu and uh, James Robinson um, that, that characterizes different countries um, as, as being either despotic leviathans or absent leviathans or shackled leviathans. Leviathan is a term, the opposite of the term. Um, basically, it just means the state, the capacity of the state over the people. In the U.S., according to S. Bobo and Robinson, the U.S. has a shackle to buy. It's a state that's big, it's powerful, it has capacity, but it's shackled. There are checks and there are balances. There's a strong um, social constraint on the ability of this uh, state. In a despotic Leviathan, the state is big, the state is powerful, the state has capacity, and there are no shackles. Cuba is a despotic um, Leviathan, according to Tosin over the That's a uh, that's uh, Similar to other planned socialist colonies like the uh, Soviet Union, Maoist China, and North Korea. Repress these are repressive regimes face, facing virtually no checks and balances or an effective opposition of the population. It's 
if you, if you ever read that, I really strongly recommend that. Um, it's kind of a follow-up to another book called um, Why Nations Fail. Despotic Leviathans repress the people without fear of anything that might place shackles on the ability to do so. If people have no power against the state. Any form of dissent is criminalized and severely punished. Hirschfeld therefore asks, to what extent is the favorable international image of the Cuban healthcare system maintained by the state's practice of suppressing dissent and covertly intimidating or imposing would-be critics? Good question. Well, but why is this image so important to Cuba? Why is it that Cuba is so focused on metrics of healthcare, like infant mortality rate, like expectancy? Because Cuba is a planet social state. And healthcare is part of the promise of socialism. Planet social states are always despotic leviathans, but there are plenty of despotic leviathans that are not uh, planned social states. Given the nature of planned socialism, the healthcare situation is perfectly understandable. Health, to understand healthcare in Cuba, we have to understand the nature of the planned social state. <clears throat> the state owns all non-labor factors production. All capital, all land, all natural resources are owned by the state. Individuals own their own labor services but the state places so many restrictions on the ability to provide our labor services that, um, that we, uh, there's not much freedom uh, there. Decision-making and information flows are highly centralized. All productive activity in the state sector is totally controlled by the state. And so every, every factory, every farm, every Retail out. Every school, every hospital is part of the government. It's a government agency. It's like going to the DMV to get your driver's license. Right? Every productive entity is part of the state. Now, in Cuba, um, they, they have opened up a very, very limited private sector. Uh, you can earn a living by driving tourists around in one of those cool 1950s cars. Right? That's permitted. That is a private sector activity. Um, but healthcare is not in that sector. Healthcare is 100% state sector. Economic activity is planned, thus the name, planned socialism. No role for prices in resource allocations. Prices are arbitrary, reflect ideological and political concerns, not economic reality. Each economic entity, each productive entity receives a plan. That plan specifies output requirements, what they will produce, and input assignments, what resources they'll receive to produce those outputs. These plans are highly detailed and um, are very, very difficult to achieve given the resources that they are given to achieve those planned targets. And if you don't make your target, there will be some very, very negative consequences. Among the output requirements of clinics and hospitals is to achieve ambitious infant mortality. Why? Why is this so, so important? Planned social states feel under attack, and they must prove the superiority of their system. They try to achieve, for instance, high rates of growth to make up the economic gap and to surpass the capitalist world. Uh, they're motivated to prove that they are the world's best in specific areas. So for instance, in sports, back in the, the days when I was a kid, 
an awful lot of Olympic gold and silver medals were, were won by Soviet athletes and East German athletes. Right? The state poured enormous resources into athletic training because this was a, a highly visible achievement of the social system. Um, culture, ballet. Well, you know, there are famous Russian ballet, uh, music, <coughs> art, and military power, like the states are. With central control of the allocation of resources, these states can achieve focused goals. The Soviet Union, for instance, beat us in the space. And when I was a kid, I remember looking up at the sky. I lived in a place where you could actually see the sky at night, watching Sputnik pass overhead. We didn't have a Sputnik. Sputnik was a Soviet satellite. In the U.S., no exception. That was cheap. That was cheap. Great propaganda, but, but these goals are pursued without proper consideration for their cost. Are these really the best ways to spend resources? Healthcare providers are given high priority targets that they must meet. This creates the incentive to misclassify early meal meal death as a late fetal death to satisfy. What would you do? If you were a doctor, right, and you've got a baby that dies, say, a few hours after the delivery, what are you going to do? You're going to classify that as you know, fetal death. Because you want to achieve those planned targets. Because if you don't, you're going to catch up. This is why it's all up to the say the data. Now, besides misclassification of, of, of uh, infant mortality, there are other ways that they can achieve this. Abortion, for instance. Once again, Cuba has the highest abortion rate in the world. And the despotic Leviathan permits doctors to order an abortion if there are any indications that a newborn might be at risk. You don't want a baby who was born who then dies because that's bad. That makes it look bad. So abort the fetus if there's any sign of trouble. The mother has no say. In her ethnographic study, Kirschfeld reports that there is, quote, no right to privacy in the physician-patient relationship with Cuba. No patient's right of informed consent, no right to refuse treatment, and no right to protest or to sue for malpractice. That protesting is criminalized. This is consistent with the data as reported above, highest rate of abortion in the world. Now, of course, this is, you know, Cuba has a, a high abortion rate not just because Cuban doctors are uh, forcing it, but also because Cubans want, they're using it as a form of birth control. Because nobody in Cuba wants to have a baby. This is a huge, huge problem for Cuba. Right? The, the uh, fertility rate has plummeted. And as a consequence, there are more and more retirees depending on fewer workers because workers are not being replaced. And of course abortion is free. Here's another way that they can affect the mortality rates. Maternity homes, these, these specialized hospitals that I told you about a little bit, that would be an alternative. The doctor doesn't want to order an abortion for at-risk fetus. They can order the mother into a maternity home. Specialized healthcare facilities where women with problematic pregnancies are given inpatient treatment during the final weeks of pregnancy. These places are good. They provide good service. And the Cubans are very proud of them. I mean, if, if you go to Cuba and you're taking around, somebody is going to say, oh, that's a maternity hospital over there. See that hospital? 
Women can go there and receive the milk. The final several weeks of their pregnancy, the absolute best health care possible. Uh, no question that these are effective in reducing uh, late fetal and infant mortality. The problem is that the patients have no choice. And they, they go, they work. If the doctor says you're going into a maternity home, you're going into a maternity home, whether you like it or not. Hirschfeld finds that this lack of agency, personal agency, the source of the negative attitudes toward health care by Cubans, despite the rosy patient display in the outside world. So, is Cubans health care all that it's cracked up to be? No, it's not. Uh, the despotic Leviathan and characteristics of the planned social state combine to distort metrics commonly used to evaluate quality of health care, while on other metrics that are not commonly reported, people report very poor. It's not free. Health care is not free. While the clinics and the hospitals and doctor services are free, they lack medicine. They lack supplies, like you know, hyperbaric needs. You've got to bring your own to the hospital. And where do you get that? You get it on the black market. And how does the black market get it? It's stolen from the hospitals, which is one of the reasons why the hospitals don't have it. The role of the black market in these economies is huge. It's huge. This is characteristic of all planned social economies. Uh, Hirschfeld cites one study that estimates that 50% of income is spent in the black market. There's very little you can find in the official state sector where you find what you're looking for is the black market. And that's expensive. And that's where you get your medicine. That's where you get your health care. And that's where you get your animals. The system is paternalistic and intrusive. Cubans lack agency in their own health care. And as a consequence, according to Hirschfeld, they have a negative perception of health care. Hirschfeld uncovered a number of discrepancies between the way the Cuban health care system has been described in the scholarly literature and the way it appears to be described and experienced by Cubans themselves. Cubans are unable to complain because the dissent is Nevertheless, Cuba has achieved a lot. Its infant mortality rate, even if adjusted the way Gonzalez and Gillespie say to, is still impressive. It's still impressive. It's not as low as high-income countries like the U.S. Right? It's a much worse infant mortality than the U.S., but still impressive for a country at its level of economic development. Cubans benefit a lot from the health monitoring and preventive medicine provided by neighborhood health clinics. And Cuba does spend a lot on health care relative to the resources it has, and it is able to achieve present results. The problem may be that these outcomes are achieved without proper accounting for opportunity costs. In other words, the resources that are devoted to achieve what they've achieved in health care are resources that could be used to achieve other goals through state-directed allocation planned social economies can achieve impressive results in selected areas, like beating the U.S. in the states. So but resource allocation <coughs> decisions are ideological and political, meant to prove the superiority of the system and are not based on economic realities. It may not be the best use of resources. So the Union did beat us to space, but it wasn't long after they beat us to space that the Soviet Union ceased to exist. Thank you.